Uh, here's a definition. A complex system is built from simpler parts. Of course it is. And all of us humans are human communities of complex systems. And in a human has input, processing and output. Our input are our five senses. Our processing is our brain. And our brain tells us whether something, this pizza tastes good or tastes bad. It's a classifying engine. It's a classifier. Good or bad. So, a complex system also has input, processing and output. The input for a human system is now interpersonal interactions and relationships. I'm your friend, I'm your enemy, I'm your rival. And the processing is now filtered through community, societal and cultural norms. So, the culture, the community defines that processing. And the output is the community judges you. The community either rewards you or punishes you. So your status is either improved or worsened. So that is a human system. What about software systems? So here is an example of a simple worker. I purposely choose words like worker and not components. Here's a worker. I'm going to make it very personal. Here's a worker. And this worker, all he does is print hello world. No big deal. But we, there are a few things we can say about this worker. This worker speaks the Go standard library. So in cultures, we have to talk about languages. In software, we also talk about languages. So this worker knows how to speak the Go standard library and he calls the format standard library to print hello world. And this worker is a generalist. Now, Singapore was part of the British colony, was a British colony. The best thing the British gave us was the bureaucracy. It is a fantastic invention for stable times. Now times are not so stable. Bureaucracies don't react so well. But when times are stable, there are things inside the bureaucracy, there are people inside the bureaucracy called clerks. And what does a clerk do? All a clerk does is he knows how to speak English, he knows how to read and write, he knows how to perform some arithmetic, and he can perform a lot of functions within the bureaucracy. He is the one that registers births and deaths, he is the one that runs the police force, he is the one that administrates laws, so the British civil service is a fantastic thing in a stable environment. And they have these generalist workers called clerks, which are replaceable, quite easily replaceable, with anybody who can read and write and speak English and do basic arithmetic. Now let's talk about the context of software. So complex software systems are also built from simpler parts. I decide to call them software workers. And these software workers interact with other software workers. We just talked about two software workers inside a Hakka roundhouse. And the system has norms and conventions. What kind of norms? The system, the language the system is written in. If the entire system speaks Go and somebody wants to speak Java, is the Java person welcome? Not inside the monolith, but over a gRPC channel maybe arm's length. If the system uh, uses RPC calls and the other fellow wants to talk messaging, is the other software worker welcome? No. So the system has its norms and conventions and if I like to make it like a human context, anthropomorphize that, it has culture. The system has culture. We wrote that culture into the system. And the system has an output. The system will get better or worse as a result of the individual software worker's contribution. Now the key question is, communities, they punish bad contributors. If you are in a human community and you do good, you get promoted. 
if you are a human community and you don't do good, the community ostracizes you and pushes you away. A software community doesn't do that. It just suffers silently. Right? The system does not punish poor performing software workers. So who punishes poor performing software workers? The designer, of course. But before we talk about designers and architects, let's talk about, we talk about generalist software workers. And generalist software workers are just people who use the standard library in a very simple, sometimes people call it simplistic way. But the standard library can only do so much. So how about specialist skills? Things which the software, the standard library does not cover. So I'm going to create a new package called engineer because I'm an engineer. And this engineering package imports the format package. And there are two exposed functions, public functions. You know they are public functions because they start with capital letters. Build bridge and pave road. Engineers build bridges and pave roads. And they don't actually build bridge. All it does is print out that I built a bridge that long and paved the road with so many square meters of town or whatever. But this is an interesting abstraction. It defines a role, a skill called engineer. And it's shoved away, stored away in a Go package, which can be kept in a repository like that. So a capable generalist worker has a library of skills he has developed. So this senior clerk knows how to say hello using the standard library and knows how to say goodbye. So he's got promoted to the foreign office. He's a protocol officer, a foreign office person. He knows how to say good hello and goodbye properly to visiting dignitaries. But he's still an individual contributor that's easy to replace with anybody who can read English who can understand the standard library. Say hello and goodbye. Easy to replace. A specialist worker like an engineer is harder to replace because you now have to pull in that set of skills. And I pull in that set of skills called ENGR. I decide to name this very, very, very long thing, ENGR. So a specialist worker like an engineer or like a doctor can call upon his skills from the library and do specialist stuff for you. So far, so good. Nothing new, nothing earth shattering. This is all motherhood truth, except doctors are hard to find. Engineers are harder to find. Specialist skills in your repository are very hard to maintain. Why? I wrote a library called ENGR. You wrote a library called ENGR. We are all contributing to the community. So there are a thousand engineering packages out there. Which one do you choose? That is a hard problem. And the solution really simply is you don't choose. The community chooses. The community votes and decides which library survives. Um, Ruby used to be very powerful five years ago. Community decided that Node.js is better. So they went to Node.js. Community decides. I hate Java. Community decides that Java is a good language. So Java is going to stay until maybe it's overtaken by Go. I don't know. You decide, the community decides, I don't decide, you individually don't decide, but you collectively as a community decides. So there is the wisdom of reinventing the view and using what the community has chosen. So put your voice out there. If the community doesn't like what you are doing, it will automatically kill it off. Nobody will use it and you will die a natural death. And you will pick um, what the community uses. So that's the important point with specialist skills. But with the standard library, there's no discussion. Standard library is baked into the language. So the language is not the language alone. 
Java is not Java alone. It's a Java plus its set of standard library, Java standard library. Go is not Go alone. It's Go plus the standard library. Where it differs, where the languages differ, is the strength of the specialist skills, stuff that's not in the standard library. So complex software systems is a community of software workers. It has generalists who use only the standard library and specialists who use specialist libraries, specialist skills, which may or may not be obsolete, which may or, not be, may, may or may not go out of fashion. We don't know. Only time will tell. And these, all these workers have varying capabilities. Some are more capable, less, some are less capable. And all of them have creation and maintenance costs. Every single worker, you have to pay them. Not money, but maintenance costs. So a good software architecture is an organization of software workers so that these all workers meet the system goal. It creates and meets the system goals. And more importantly, the system can evolve to meet changing demands. The British Civil Service met its goals at that time, but it has a difficult time changing to meet new goals. So it's not a very good system in a dynamic environment. A very good system in a static environment. So human organization structures, hierarchical, collegial, cross-functional, project-based, functional, startups, societies, race, religion, government, states, these are all labels we apply to human organizational structures. Software organizational structures, we just talked about monoliths, we talked about microservices, we talked about SOA, which is now bad word. We talked about software libraries and frameworks and repositories. What is the difference between a library and a framework? Can anybody tell me? A library is something which your program calls. Obviously, right? Format library, call format print line component to print something on the screen. A library is something your program which you have written calls. A framework is you write a program for the framework to call. Ruby on Rails, you write a model, model.rb. The framework has a starting point. The framework starts up and it calls your program. So a framework is a formalized structure, a standardized way of doing things that is pluggable. So you plug in your programs and at certain points, the framework will call your program to do a different function. The British Civil Service is such a framework. Foreign Service, Police Department, Immigration, blah, blah, blah. You provide code for the Foreign Service. People who know how to greet people, hello and goodbye. Foreign visitors, that kind of thing, or 007 spy, whatever. So these are software organizational structures. But what is success? In a human community, Success is when the community feels good and you have a good leader who has foresight and planning and is able to make the hard decisions. In a software system, the software must fulfill its purpose. But it must be readable, maintainable, and extensible. Any more to add? What are the merits of a good software system? Those are the three things. It must be readable because you cannot read the thing you cannot maintain the thing, you cannot extend the thing. So, where do I draw my inspiration? Hakka Roundhouse was drawn from a cultural reference. I'm a Hakka, so I looked at my cultural reference and I created Hakka Roundhouse. So how do you create successful software systems? I draw my inspiration from business. I was trained as an engineer, went to business school, got my MBA, ran a company, decided to semi-retire, formed my consulting firm. And the most important thing they, dis they tell you in business school, which you discover for yourself in business school, is 
assign responsibility together with accountability. You are responsible for this area and you are accountable for it. Go and take care of it. Surround yourself with good people and let them do their work. So that's business 101. And you need to be very clear with your goals. Goals must be specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, time-bound. These are S-M-A-R-T goals, smart goals. Standard business 101 thing. Can we apply that to software design? I think we can. Think about human responsibilities. You have the board of directors, you have the CEO, the top level executive, CTO. You have engineering operations, names are very important. You call them an engineer, all they'll do is engineer stuff. You call them operations, all they'll do is operate stuff. You call them DevOps, they will develop and operate stuff. Names are powerful. People say sticks and stones may break my bones, but names can never hurt me. False. Names are very powerful. Be careful with names. So the first thing you want to do with declaring software responsibilities is to name the responsibility and the role very clearly. Here I've decided to come up with a simple web app. Front end, customer management, order management, fulfillment. So these are all typical names you find in software. How do you implement those responsibilities? So in a startup, I decided to start up a company with two other friends, the three jokers in the startup. We do everything. We do accounting, we do marketing, we do everything. We don't have the luxury of scale. A large enterprise could have one head of technology and a whole bunch of people working under him. Same responsibility, different implementation. Same responsibility, technology development different implementation. It can be implemented within one person, monolith. It can be implemented using an army of software workers, microservices. Important thing is the responsibility. So a set of deployables fulfill a role or responsibility. And this responsibility or role is a really fuzzy, abstract thing. But the things which implement them are concrete the microservice binary, the set of microservices binaries, the monolith binary versus the monolith binary, ah, microservice binaries. So we have to talk about good deployables, artifacts. What's a good human worker? Independent worker, reliable, innovative, good communicator, so on and so forth. What's a good software worker? Independently deployable. I don't have to wait for anybody. That, I think, is my number one. Human, independent worker. Software, independently deployable. Number one priority. He does one thing and does one thing well. All this solid principle stuff. Right? But number one, independently deployable. And he must perform high performance, low latency. So let's, enough of the abstract thing, let's work an example and concretize what, I'm, what is in my head and I try to do a direct memory access and direct memory transfer to you guys through this medium. So I like adding two numbers because kindergarten taught me that. So I'm going to write a web app to add two numbers. It's a complex system. Why is it complex? Because it's got a front end, it's got a router that routes requests to the back end. So at minimum, it's got three parts already. So we are implementing what all of you know as MVC, Model View Controller. Martin, Robert C. Martin says MVC is not an architecture. I don't know whether I agree with him or not. But anyway, we are implementing MVC in this example. So like I said, the first thing is name the responsibilities. So a front end is quite clear. It's the web page facing the users. Is front end a responsibility? I think so. Is the router a responsibility that routes different API requests, not API requests, URL endpoints to the back end? I think the router, I decided to call it a front lobby, main lobby, so you can channel from the main lobby to the different back rooms. That architecturally is a component. 
is a responsibility. And of course, adder, the thing that actually adds things together, is certainly a responsibility. That's clear. So adder is clearly a responsibility, but front end and router, are they separate things? Are they separate responsibilities? What do you think? Can we in introduce multiplier instead of adder without changing the front end and router? Can? Cannot? Is there coupling? Of course there is. So is MVC a good architecture because there's coupling? It's not independently deployable? Let's consider that extreme case. Adder handles its own front end and routing. So Adder has its own front end, Adder has its own routing. Multiply is added, you have another front end, another routing. Good, bad. I think most of us would agree it is not so good. It's bad. But this is what independently deployable means. How do we resolve this conflict? How do we resolve? We feel, we know, we like MVC. But independently deployable, no. It doesn't meet the needs. And I think this tension comes about because we are confusing things. We are confusing software architecture with building architecture. It happens to share the same name, but completely different things. A building architect imagines different functions of different areas of the buildings, and they are implemented as physical structures, which are hard to change. You have to knock down walls, very hard to change. A software architect must also think about responsibilities and areas, but he should stop there and hand over his vision to the implementer, the software engineer, the developer. That is the job of the software engineers. So what does the software engineer do? He takes this hazy, wazy, abstract concept from the architect, design a plan to build artifacts. And these artifacts, unlike building artifacts, are cheap. There are no concrete to pour. We make it expensive because we manually make those artifacts. If you automate this process, building the artifact, building the artifact is cheap. It may take 10 seconds, it may take an hour, but it's cheap if you automate the process. If you don't automate the process, it's expensive because somebody has to manually go step by step to create those artifacts. So as a good software engineer, you better automate. And this process is called DevOps. That's all it is. That's why it's so popular. Right? To automatically create deployable artifacts. And it's unlike changing a building structure. Because it can be created so easily. So, the adder package. Let's make it concrete. I have an internal function called SumString that converts two strings into integers and adds them up and returns an integer and an error status. That's all it does. Capital Adder Handler is something which you expose to the world. We are creating a specialist library here. Whether this specialist library survives or not, as I said, depends on the community. It's your job to put out this option, but the community decides whether it's a accepted popular option but it's your job to go and either choose the best in the community or come up with something better something which you think is better so what this adder handler does is it just adds two numbers and for good measure i want to print out the time as well just for the just for the fun of it so it adds two numbers and prints out the time now let's look at the router logic in Go, the router logic is quite clear. Handle all root paths under root handler. Handle anything under static path under a file server. So basically, Go gives you uh, Nginx and a, a Apache server 
in the language itself. Because Go feels that web is popular, the community decide that web is a very powerful concept. So Go in the standard library has given you a web server and a file server which can act like an Nginx or can act like an Apache server. That is HTTP file server. That's all it is. And any paths that say adder is routed to my adder package, adder handler. Because I created an adder package adder handler, I can take this thing out and substitute with somebody else's package if it's better. The problem is they must be compatible. And that's where gRPC comes in. Because gRPC tells you straight away whether they are compatible or not. Here I can't tell by looking at it whether they are compatible. But because they speak web language, you will see in a while, all handlers are compatible. Okay, let's go through this. Most of you will recognize is standard HTML. Absolutely rock solid standard HTML, except for this line. This whole string is encoded into a variable, sorry, a constant called main screen. And this funny backtick means. It's a string, it's a raw string. Everything you come across is treated as part of the string until you come across another backtick. So the entire HTML page is encoded as a constant string. But there's something special here. Here, adder form. Here, I'm making use of Go templates to insert adders presentation. So, adder is responsible for this part. The presentation is responsible for everything else. So, here you have shared responsibility. So, if you go to any large organization, you have a reception counter, right? You won't have a reception counter for engineering, you won't have a reception counter for finance, you have one reception counter. But, if it's a Inland Revenue Service, for example. There may be some experts who are tax law experts or company law experts in the reception counter, which the counter staff can refer you to. So these expert staff also sit in the reception counter. It's a shared counter. But there are some specialist areas in that shared counter. Same thing, same concept here. Presentation is definitely a responsibility. It is a reception counter. But the specialist area is adder. So that part is marked out for you. This is your area. Right? You sit with the rest of the reception staff, but that is your area. Um, and this is what adder does. The adder form, that's what it does. It creates the form to accept inputs from two integers and display a result. The presentation desk doesn't know anything about adder. Adder's responsibility is to implement this. So he's got adder A, adder B, uh, and that's it. And now the main template. Here is where you inject uh, add a form into, into the main program. So here, I, in, those of you not familiar with Go, this funny thing over here is an anonymous structure. I don't have to declare it separately, I declare it inline. It's an anonymous structure with one field. And that field is called add a form. That field is called add a form. And the type of that field is HTML. HTML type from the template library. Then I can add in my adder form which I created just now, which I showed you just now, this one. I can add in this form. And it will show up in that single binary. Uh, 
I can't run away from JavaScript. I love to not write a single line of JavaScript, but cannot. If you want to do front end stuff, you want to do front end interaction, the browser only understands JavaScript or TypeScript or some variation of JavaScript. So you're forced to learn JavaScript, and I'm forced to learn JavaScript. But this JavaScript belongs where? Belongs to Edda. This JavaScript file is Edda's responsibility, nobody else's responsibility. It doesn't belong to the router, it doesn't belong to the front end, it is Edda's responsibility. So let's see this in action. Enough talk, I must go and do something. So it just says at the starting and I need to go to 8080. So the front end takes care of the main header, takes care of the CSS styling, and adder takes care of this part, and that part alone. So in that sense, there's separation of concerns, but there's still one thing, it's that front desk with that specialist lawyer sitting in the corner. Does it work? Let's see. 2 plus 3 equals 5. It works. Okay, let's go back to the slides. I told myself, you just reinvented Ruby on Rails and a bad version of it. You reinvented a bad version of Ruby on Rails. Yucks. But then I say, what's wrong with Ruby on Rails? Ruby on Rails is very productive. Not all of us are Googles. Not all of us are Facebooks. For some of my customers, Ruby on Rails is a perfect fit. But this independently deployable thing really disturbs me. Now I'm combining my stuff, putting my lawyer in the front desk with other people in the reception counter. MVC, it violates independently deployable. The software artifact generated by the build process is a single binary. You saw that already, right? So I won't run this. But let's look at the software teams. Conway Law says this. The structure of your software depends on your team structure. So the adder team is responsible for adder.go, obviously. It's responsible for adder.js. Okay, maybe you're now going to somebody else's territory. You're going into the UI interaction territory. But okay, let's say it's your responsibility. Your responsibility for the main function, adder go, okay. And main go, of course. Eh, main go again. Main goal is repeated several times in the front end, in the lobby. Is there separation of concerns here? Not on a file level, certainly not on a file level. But there is, I think so, I think so. Only if you maintain discipline. Why do I say that? Here. Okay, where am I? Where am I? Here. If I choose not to go into the fellas area, I won't disturb him. It's in the same file. It can be in the same repo. But I choose not to make edits to that area. They are virtually separate, but physically together. You get the concept? They are virtually different, but physically implemented in the same file. This is not for mere mortals because we don't have the discipline to enforce this and our developers will 
will mess this up in no time. So that's why Martin, Robert C. Martin says, MVC is not architecture, it's a mess. I say no, it's practical, but we need to enforce discipline. We need to enforce discipline. And if we can put bold command lines, do not touch this adder's area, then it's okay. We maintain virtual separation in the physical file. Go is like that. Go has pointers. Such a backward language, pointers. Why? Because it's practical. So don't be idealistic. Uh, I've learned in my career that software architecture is not something idealistic, it's something practical. So MVC is practical. It works separate virtually. Ah, we are right. Okay, we've covered that. So only if discipline is maintained and boundaries, virtual boundaries I, I maintain are respected. And if you want to shrink the reception desk from a big desk to a small desk, obviously there's going to be a problem, right? Our lawyer friend is going to get kicked out. We don't have a desk to sit on. So similarly, if somebody changes the system CSS, the app.css or the main.css, and chooses a very tiny font, your form is going to break, right? That is interaction. So in the business world, as well as in the software world, there's going to be turf wars, there's going to be office politics, there's going to be boundaries, and there needs to be coordination. Same thing in the software world. So that's why I say discipline is the key for practical systems. That's why I came out with Hakka Roundhouse. You saw that already. And I enforce the discipline using gRPC. It's one implementation of this thinking. But what if the responsibility changes? Do we upgrade old responsibility to new responsibility and change the world and replace all the deployables? Or do we do a swap out? Retrench old responsibility and hire new responsibility? What do we do? We are always faced with that question, right? Let's make it concrete. A company, Smith Corona, makes typewriters. Should they upgrade to making computers and retrain all its workers to make computers? Or retire the whole department, create a new department, and hire new workers with the skills to make computers? Now, obviously, this is a very sensitive thing in the real world. Jobs and lives are at stake. Software, much simpler less at stake. Morally, what do we choose? Morally. Smith Corona decided to be like an ostrich, stick the head, head in the sand and continue making typewriters and they died. Nobody uses typewriters anymore. Morally, we want to upgrade. Reality, a whole bunch of people get retrenched. That's the reality. But the software domain is not so heartless. Software is actually kinder than human organizations. So recall general software workers use the standard library. And the standard library is part of the language. It doesn't change, it's built in. Less, general, less capable generators get archived, got retrenched. Lah. And new general workers are rewritten. And it's quite easy to write these new general workers because the, all they do is to call the standard library and they can be five lines long. So throw away your old code and write five line long standard library code. That's what I'm recommending. But the problem is specialist workers. Stuff which you have invested millions of man hours creating that now are a big ball of mud. What do you do with them? You have this specialist worker that built certain five rockets that now nobody knows how to build anymore. What do you do? You upgrade or you replace? My answer is you extract those skills and put them into a software library. 
and rewrite the modules extracting those software library functions. So you've got to decompose your big giant ball of mud into usable parts which can be reused into libraries and hope the community accepts them. When I say community, it's the software community you're operating in. If you're working in NASA, it's a Saturn V booster library components. If you're working in Traveloka, it's something to do with booking travel systems. All right. So software skills are held in libraries and those skills survive or die depending on the community's response. So why the responsibilities grow? Uh, they are making computers now, but now they have to make mobile phones. Related skill. What if it grows? And this is the problem we always face. This is the problem we always face. How do we grow a software module? This is not the architect's responsibility. Architect tells you the rest, tells you the vision. The engineer writes the deployables. If your deployables were written the unique stuff using pipelines, using Go routines, using channels, you can just plug in a new function. It's really pluggable. If you decide to write a normal function, oh my goodness, there's too much freedom, big ball of mud. If you had, if you had enforced the boundaries using gRPC, using Go function, uh, Go routines, using channels, you can just plug in word count in this case. Just like in Unix, it's so easy to write it in bash because of that philosophy. Who's to blame? Not architect. We, software developers, engineers, we wrote, we choose to write bad monoliths because we were not disciplined. When you're writing code, or by all means, put it down on your screen, write the code. But before you even commit the code, or commit and then immediately refactor. Refactor by imposing discipline. Refactor by imposing Go routines, channels, gRPC, whatever your method, impose the discipline. Then check it in again to the repository. So adding a new puppy into the pipe chain is easy. Teaching an old dog new tricks, extending a, a muddy monolith is really hard. And it's not the architect's fault. It is us, the software developer's fault. Oh, the last thing is quite interesting. When we extend a big ball of mud, please go and write this. Because that's the only way, that's the safety net for you. The only way you can put in stuff without breaking things. And hopefully your tests catch those mistakes, which you are going to make. So to wrap up, a key design activity is to name things, to name the responsibilities. And those responsibilities should remain abstract. The people who implement those responsibilities are software developers, us. And a key thing is to automate the building of those software artifacts. DevOps culture, very important. Continuous integration, continuous delivery. And the responsibility should be loosely coupled to our software artifacts. Don't get attached to the software worker. The workers are dispensable. The language, the culture, the libraries are not. Build the libraries, build the culture, build the frameworks, kill the workers, replace them. So, that is how I think we can build, design, and extend software systems. Comments? Very abstract, I understand. Maybe talking at a very high level. Um, and that's why I was hesitant in giving this talk in the first place. But this was the inspiration for Hakka Roundhouse. Hakka Roundhouse came out of this. Um, when you implement microservices, um, 
one of my friends here in this room told me, yeah, but my colleagues just do anything they want. Now we don't know what messages are being passed around. We have a big ball of mud, and now it's a distributed ball of mud. <laughs> yeah. Because the discipline wasn't there. Okay, let's, I'll keep quiet now. Any questions? If not, thank you. You've been a good audience.